it's so critical that even the people around you at the moment on your come up is important. Making sure that people are, that are aligned with you can encourage you and breathe life into you. And if they're not, please vacate their premises immediately. Because when you have a dream, you have to be laser focused because somebody less talented than you that believes in themselves just a little bit more is going to far surpass you and you're going to be miserable about it. My name is Datavio Samuels, and welcome to The Black Print, where I sit with the innovators, disruptors, and change makers. My guests open up about every step of their journey and share lessons learned along the way to provide creators, entrepreneurs, and executives with a tangible blueprint for navigating to the top of their industry. This is The Black Print. Welcome to the Black Print. Here, we start every show with my favorite quote. Everybody sees you on the mountaintop. Not everybody sees you on the climb. This is the show where we talk to the ceiling breakers, the innovators, the disruptors about their climb to the top. Today, I'm so proud and so privileged to have a wonderful, beautiful MC Supreme sitting next to me. Lady London, how are you doing today? I'm so good. How are you? I'm blessed. It's good to have you here. Yeah. At Revolt, we believe that everybody should control and own their own narrative. And so yeah. instead of introducing my guests, I'm going to ask you to look at that camera and tell people who you are. Fair enough. What's up, everybody? My name is Lady London. I am a rapper, songwriter, author, poet, tastemaker, curator, and the Aristotle of bravado. Easily one of the best rappers of the 21st century. And this is the Black Print. Come on, let's get into it. Hey, I love that. <laughs> Even just there, I'm going to go back to the beginning, but you said the Aristotle of bravado. Mm -hmm. Break that down. What does that mean to you? So Aristotle is one of the great philosophers of our time. Well, not our time, but you know, <laughs> just like uh, the Socrates and the Plato's of the world. They had great influence on the way we viewed logos and ethos and just like all the things that go into one. And bravado is a different word for confidence and boldness and... Um, but it doesn't have a, a undertone of arrogance to it. It just is what it is. And I think that is what I walk in or I try to at every step of my journey. It's just a confidence that is undisputed and it comes from the highest level of consciousness. Yeah, love that. Love yeah. that. All right. So today, Aristotle of Bravado, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Let's do what it. was life like? What was your childhood look like growing up? It was beautiful. I was a happy kid. I grew up in a Caribbean household. I'm half Jamaican, half Trini. Okay. Got a little so, Jamaican in me too. Yeah. Didn't you? <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, so I had a household that really believed in the importance of education and, uh, forward thinking more specifically. Um, but it was an amazing childhood, mm -hmm. very full of life, very into hip hop music mm -hmm. from young. Um, but that was the culture, you know? Yeah. When you were young, who were some of the, the hip hop artists that were catching your attention? Oh man, I love like Foxy and Kim. Okay. A lot. You okay. know, I was, I remember being like three years old singing like Crush on You. <laughs> Uh, ain't no nigga. Not the, not the clean version, by the way. <laughs> Bleeping it out on my own. My mom never played clean. Um, versions of anything around us, but that was my vibe. But I also like, of course, the Barris Hammond, the Buju, you know, to clean the house. Mm -hmm. That's what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you heard that in the morning, it was time to clean up. So, you got a favorite Buju song or a favorite Barris song? Like, those are two people that I love. I it. mean, of course, I feel good. Okay. Of course. And then, um, Buju, maybe it's a cliche to say Boom Bye Bye, but mm -hmm. one of my, yeah, one of the yeah, ones, yeah. you know? <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> For sure. And then, are, so are you first? Are you first generation American born? I'm second generation American. Okay, you're second generation yes, my mom's American. also born here. Um, and yeah, I'm second generation on both sides. My dad was was my dad's family is from Trinidad too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so both my grandparents, my my grandmother, my father's side still lives in Trinidad. Okay. So anything about um, your Caribbean upbringing that you think is unique and different and has significantly contributed to the woman that you are today? Oh, 100 percent. Everything about my upbringing contributed to the woman I am. Mm -hmm. I honestly didn't know that so many people didn't do what was like customary in my household until I went to college. Mm, give me an like, example. Yeah. Um, we have a very interesting way of like hygiene, even in Jamaican households. It's like very specific. We have this like 
cleaning agent that's called Dettol, and we use it for like everything, um, like everything. I don't know, just things like taking tea when you're like really sick or when you're when you have like a gas or just I don't mean, even washing your panties in the in the in the shower before you put them in a washing machine. It's like things that I thought everyone did that. Okay. Like I had no idea until I went to college. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, girl, you don't. You know what I'm saying? So just interesting stuff like that. And what did young Lady London think she wanted to be? Like growing up, what were your dreams? Um, When I was really young, I always wanted to be a doctor from okay. as, as early as I can remember. When I was really young, I wanted to be a dermatologist originally. Um, Why a dermatologist? Because my dermatologist was so pretty. She was like so like put together. She was like such a lady. Like always had like heels and a flyest like vintage couture stuff on in the office under her white coat. And I always thought that her skin glowed and I wanted to kind of be in that space. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And then I went into wanting to go into orthopedics when I got into college. And I wanted to do um, orthopedics, non-surgical, and work for an NFL team and mm -hmm. get up everybody conditioned and back on the field in a good time. Why NFL? You had a love for football. You had a passion for I still for love football. Okay. But I find that their contracts are so... Shifty, you know, because in the NBA and a lot of other sports, you can pretty much sit on the bench injured for as long as, you know, whatever. But NFL, they give you a very short window before you have to rehabilitate and give back or you kind of out of your money. And I think um, I always felt for that because mm -hmm. people work really hard to get to the league. And I think they should have all the playing time that. Okay, so when I think of dermatologists, I think of fixers. Mm -hmm. When I think of, uh, what was the last one you said? Orthopedics. You said? Orthopedics. Like, are, do you think of yourself as a fixer or a healer or a yeah. giver? Is any of that a part of your nature and who you are? Yeah, I think I have an instinctive maternal nature to me that's very, like, healing and nurturing. I think I'm the oldest also. Like, I have two sisters that are younger than me and one brother younger. And I've all, and I'm marginally older than them. I, my youngest sister is like eight years younger than me and then 14 years younger than me. So I've always had like, I guess, a parental spirit. I'm very protective about everyone around me, my whole team, my family. I just, you know, like that's my thing. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think that's our job as a people though. And what do you mean by that? That's that. our job as a people. I think we're like put here on this earth to heal it mm. to an extent like you can you contribute your version of healing to the to the universe so mm. is there a certain so you said you contribute your version yeah is there a certain community that you think about healing is there a certain pathway or way that you think about healing when you think about your own life underserved people the unseen the unheard the people who don't have voices or um or i guess notable places in society mm. Um, I'm always curious to see like what the person of mystery or the, or the person that's the quietest in the room, like what's their story. Mm. And I'm careful with people because I don't know people's journeys or what it took them to get out of bed in the morning. So I'm very like, I try to walk into rooms and with a bright spirit, you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah you can never lose by walking into a room with a bright spirit. In yeah. fact, I wish more people <laughs> yeah. right, would walk like, into Like leave that bag exactly. where you exactly. left it. You know what I'm saying? Like, positive energy, positive vibes for only. For sure. For sure. <laughs> okay. So tell me about high school. So as you move your way into high school, uh -huh. still focused on education? Yeah. Very much so? Yeah. I mean, I was a little hothead in high school. Okay. Um, rebellious youth. It wasn't always like fun and giggles you know what i'm saying my mom was very concerned about me in my middle school going into high school years like um i wasn't laser focused on education school always just came really natural to me so i would get my report card back it'd be like a's and b's but the behavioral side be like she don't follow directions she don't work well in groups she can't work well with others and i think i had like a natural rebellious spirit because I was just bored, I think, with mm -hmm. the people around me, with my surroundings. Um, and I think environmental stimuli can play a big role in how you act. Mm -hmm. so. You still rebellious? You still got that rebellious spirit? It's deep down. It's deep down? It's deep down. But I got baptized, so like when I went under the water, I, okay. think, it, I think it's... <laughs> And how you know. old were you when you got baptized? I was 23. Okay, okay. So yeah. we'll get to that. We'll move into that yeah. when we talk post-college. So high school, rebellious spirit, yeah. naturally good at school. Were you doing anything like extracurriculars? Like yeah. is, is rap in your world in this in, in this moment in time? No, it's poetry um, for the most part. I was on obviously cheer and drill for like school and stuff like that. But 
poetry is big and it's like what is escaping me from the rebellious and the fighter in me. Like every time I was like involved in something outside, my outlet was to come home and write. Mm. So yeah, poetry was a big, a big thing. I just like literature too. I like reading. I like writing. I just enjoy words. Favorite poets? You clearly, it's very clear that you enjoy words. <laughs> it's very clear that you have a gift with words. Any like um, favorite poets that you had back then? Um, Jasmine Mance. She's incredible. She's um, from my hometown as well. And she's just great. I love her. Who else? Um, I do Langston Hughes. You do a little Langston Hughes back then? I do a little, yeah, yeah, a little Langston. Uh, (laughs) Ralph Waldo Emerson, of course, Fireside Poets. Yeah. Um, you know, there's the, the classics, the Maya Angelos, you oh, know, yeah, Toni Morrison's, like, oh, yeah. of course. Um, but if I think of modern day, I would say Jasmine Mans is definitely up there. Sheehan mm-hmm. is also dope. Dana Gilmore. Um, yeah, some mm-hmm. people. For people who are watching who may be trying to find their way or maybe who need an escape, any books that you would recommend that they read any or any poets you want to direct them to? Books? I think that depends on what part of life they're in right now. Mm-hmm. Like I would have a, I, I've read a, quite a lot of books, mm-hmm. but it depends on what direction they're trying to take. I would say the four agreements, of course, learning not to take things personal, uh, the alchemist, um, alchemist is always a hit. I mean, <laughs> every time 48 laws of power. You read 48 laws of power. I, I can't lie. <laughs> like, um, I started reading 48 laws of power mm-hmm. and I think it's, I actually think it's critical reading, but I also think my like spirit was feeling like can feel a little icky when you think about how people can use those, those laws to be manipulative. Yes. You and that's I mean? with anything. Yeah. yeah. I can understand it. It's, and it's a book that you have to get through. I don't think it's one of them that you read it and you read it quickly. It's something mm-hmm. that can table for months at a time where you just highlight. Those type of books are things you have to comb through. It's not it's not a sit down read like a fictional book yep, or something yep. to that nature. Um, the, for women it, and for men, obviously, definitely for men, but for women, I would say what, reading The Way of a Superior Man Who? is important to know get about the cheat that code. Way of superior it's man. the cheat code. Yo, it is the cheat code. It's the cheat code <laughs> to understanding like getting into their minds, you know. Um, I think that's important. And of course, anything Joe Dispenser, but that's a whole another story for another time. But becoming supernatural and all the things. Mm-hmm. So, Forty Eight yeah. Laws of Power, one of my like, and it's the first rule I think. Yeah. But key to me is like never outshine the master. Yes. Like, yep. It is a lesson that has stuck with me forever that I have mm-hmm. leveraged to navigate through life. Any specific law in there that same thing for you? You're like, oh, yeah. This actually, one is that's like, crazy. Yeah, it would okay. be that. It, it would was, definitely be that. Okay, so you also mentioned The Way of the Superior Man, which is a book I love. Yeah. I'm totally in alignment with you. I think every man should read um, that book. One of my favorite ones in there is that women are not liars. Do you remember that piece? Yeah. And I think as a man, it's so easy. Um, I personally am hyper-rational, hyper-logical. Mm-hmm. And so learning and understanding that every time a woman changes her mind, it's not lying. Yeah. She's going off of her emotions and her feelings. Yeah. And that's how she feels in the moment. And 20 minutes she just made later, she may feel very differently, right? Yeah. And so being able to have that understanding, I think, has been super useful in my way of interacting with people from the opposite sex. Yeah. Um, give me your thoughts on the way of the superior man. Yeah, like you know, any it's favorites. It's crazy in there? that you brought that point up because I feel like it's important that we understand rationale Mm -hmm. just across the board like not everything is a problem and I think that is what mainly the book is about the dichotomy between male and female relationship dynamics that can coexist under one blanket and it doesn't have to be like outwardly like you're wrong or I'm wrong or, or I'm superior or I'm i the superior man is a is a conscious level thing. Exactly right. Rather than an alpha, like I'm the boss, I'm the boss. I think two Absolutely. alphas can coexist in one space. Um, and it takes it takes a real leader to know when it's time to step back and allow a partner to lead. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the most important part and take away from the book mm-hmm. for me. I also so. love, I just, um, I'm thinking about this piece that's like, women are like the ocean, yes. right? And it can rage and mm-hmm. it can be calm. And oftentimes men are like the ship trying to drive through that ocean, yeah. right? And again, as a man trying to figure out when it's okay to like, let the ocean rage, right? Yeah. Like work with the ocean. It's going to go through all of these different um, waves and emotions. But to your point, it's not that one is better than the other. It's that uh, we're we just, different. it's just that we, we are have different. differences. 
I watch so much of what's happening on social media, watching men and women oh go gosh. at it. And um, specifically in our community, there's like black men, black women often yeah. warring. And I think about like, if we would read books like The Way of the Superior Man, sure. then we might be able to find our way towards each other. Right? And just raise our awareness. And that's why reading is so fundamental. I know it's a lost art form that we just don't do anymore. Mm. We got audio books. Like you don't even got to actually read. Just, <laughs> just like, you know, move through, yeah, move through the car, <laughs> drive with it. Um, but it can teach us so much about just the differences that exist within us and why we need to come to a a clear understanding. But that's a whole nother podcast for a whole nother time. Yeah. I imagine. <laughs> All right. So let's go. So post high school, yeah. you end up going to Howard, right? Yes, that's right. How do you make the decision to go to Howard? Why and why did you were you always gonna go to an HBCU? Yeah. Okay, so why first and foremost? Why an HBCU? Mm -hmm. And then why how of all the HBCUs, why Howard? So my whole life I went to Catholic school. Okay. Always to private school my whole life. Um even bust out three counties from where I lived at just to go to school in a better area. My mom just always knew my brain was beyond what was available resource-wise for mm -hmm. our community. So I went to Catholic school my whole life. And majority of them were very few Black and Latinx kids, mm -hmm. especially my high school. When I, my high school was about 3% Black. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of maybe 11 or 10 Black women in my all-girls Catholic high school. And I hung out with all 10 of them. We had our own table. It was almost like segregation in there. And so I always just wanted to feel more of a part of a community. And when I was researching HBCUs, because I'm the first in my family to go to college. Mm. So I didn't have an auntie or an uncle or a parent figure to be like, oh, you got to go to my alma mater. You know what I'm saying? I didn't have that look for me. So I felt like HBCUs teach you that you shouldn't feel guilty about speaking out or organizing or taking issue with the conditions of African-Americans in society. And I wanted to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. So I went to the real and the only HU, the Mecca, um, the illustrious Howard University. And it was the best decision of my life. Mm -hmm. If I can go back, I would not in this body because this body, the check engine light on my knees is on, but in... <laughs> In my 18 year old body, I would go back for sure. <laughs> and 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 why? Like, why did you love and appreciate that decision? What did what did Howard give you that you think you may not have been able to find or get and receive somewhere else? A sense of community and discipline. Um, I went into Howard a lost girl, and I came out a grown woman. Mm. I think it shaped my viewpoint on so much, like. I really didn't care. Like I told you, I was a rambunctious teenager. Um, I went away to school because like I was always told I had to go to school and I had to, you know, whatever. And if I was going to be a part of the community, it had to be the black community. So I went to HBC with no real like, yeah, I wanted educational goals, but I didn't think I would come out with so much experience of life, mm -hmm. you know. And I know there's like this whole thing where they say like PWIs are the real reality of school because 72 percent of the world is white. It's like. The reality is if you learn how to make it in these communities and at Howard, if you can make it at Howard, you can make it anywhere. Mm -hmm. The difficulties that we face just to navigate the system alone, financial aid, to housing administration, to making sure you get registered for your classes on time, all the things. It's mm -hmm. like we're fighting a battle that gives us resilience and tenacity that we bring into the real world and into our workforces. And mm -hmm. so... Best decision of my life. Mm -hmm. Any words of advice for those people out there who may be feeling lost right yeah. now? Um, maybe they don't have the opportunity to go to a Howard yeah. or an HBC, but sure. any words of advice from your experience about how you went, would you say you went from being a lost woman to a... To a grown woman. A grown woman. Yeah. Any advice about how you take that journey? I think... I would say it begins with seeing yourself beyond your own block. And this is something I tell my li my little sister. She's in high school now, and she's like, like just like me, mm -hmm. except she doesn't have anything that motivates her to like go to the next thing. And I'm like, you don't see beyond this, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. If you can see yourself the way God views you, the way I view you, I think you can you can do so much in the world. I would say anybody who's on this journey, and I don't also, I don't believe college is for everybody. So let me just put that into perspective now. I don't think you have to go to college to have a great understanding of who you are, but you have to have a North Star. You have to have an end goal. You have to have a, this is what I want. And this is what I see for myself. And it's nothing that I can't do in this world. Mm -hmm. So 
Mm-hmm. Walking with a spirit of excellence. Walk like you could do it. Put your head up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's a, a, a beautiful story about ensuring that you have purpose, finding yes. your why. And it also taps into one of my favorite quotes, which is um, exposure to the next level mm-hmm. breeds an intolerance for your current situation. Mm-hmm. The reason people are so comfortable being on their block is it's because it's all they've been exposed to. Right. Yeah. And so, so much of the journey is trying to figure out how do you expose yourself to different things? Yeah. So that you can figure out who you want to be. Like the bad example I use is like um, when I was young, I didn't know that people summered, right? Okay. How do you dream of summering if you don't know that summering is a thing? Now I know it's a thing and I'm not dreaming of it, but it's my choice, yes. right? Before it wasn't my choice. Mm. I just didn't know you about it, know. right? Yeah. And so love this notion about like you got to find ways to expose yourself to things that are beyond your block. Yeah. I love that idea. Um, okay, so you came coming out of Howard. What was your major and what was your dream? Yes, my major in Howard, I double majored in sports medicine and chemistry. Um, really good in science, has always loved science. Um, so you're both good with words and good with math. <laughs> I am good with science, math okay, is science. an exact science. Okay, but I love, I just love science in mm. general. I think. I think it's a, it's literally just like life. Like you have a thesis, you draw a hypothesis, mm-hmm. you do your research, you present the stats, and then you make a conclusion. Mm-hmm. I think that's like the circle of life, mm-hmm. if anything. Mm-hmm. So I always really understood science. Um, I love research. I love case studies. So yes, sports medicine and chemistry, double major. I finished at Howard. I went on to study global medicine and international health policy mm-hmm. at the University of Southern California at Keck School of Medicine. Mm-hmm. So that's my journey to LA. So I've been here for seven years since then. And I earned my master's um, right after. Okay. So you are um, doing your science thing. You're in love with science. You're gifted with science. Yeah. Um, how do you pivot? Like, where does where does hip hop come into the? Because right now your story would take me into you being a doctor for or sure. a scientist, right? What like what happens that makes you decide to pivot? So completely, and I don't really believe in haphazardness, but mm-hmm. completely like not my intention. Mm-hmm. I won't say it was like out of nowhere because nothing happens by chance. So I truly believe that. But um. I dropped the, I always did poetry, like I said, and I continued to write throughout college. I ended up writing a book, which was interesting. I put out a, a, a fiction, um, in between going from my undergrad to grad school that was doing really well. And so I continued to keep in my, in my literature and in my, my writing. And one day when I was leaving class, I put my phone on my dashboard and I recorded a video doing poetry, right? But the way my voice is, the way that I just articulate myself, it all kind of sounds like rapping, even though it's poetry. No beat, no nothing. And I dropped it online and I closed my phone. I had about 9,500 followers just organically. Like those are like my friends, whatever. And then um, I get to where I'm going and it's like going crazy. This is before like Instagram stories were out, before you can do swipes. Like this is a while ago. So the video is going viral. It ends up going 8.7 million views wow. viral. And I get a whole bunch of new followers and a whole bunch of like inquiries. Like when you start rapping, like this is so fire, like whatever, whatever. Labels are reaching out. And I'm like, what are y'all talking about? Like I do not rap. Like I do poetry. I just talk a little slick in my poetry, but I don't do rap. And um, I started to kind of look into it a little bit more because everybody was like, you should try it on a beat. And I was like, okay. And I turned on a beat and I sound awful like it was <laughs> terrible i could not catch the pocket for nothing because poetry is so free form and it's like you can say as many words as you want whereas rapping is like syllabic so you have to count the meters you have to like you know be in pocket for stuff and i remember going to my bro's house and i was like teach me how to rap because he like rapped or whatever and he was like i don't know how to teach you how to rap so for three months straight for the duration of the summertime I would listen to Jay-Z, listen to Jadakiss, listen to Foxy, listen to like all the people who I thought were great rappers. Like I like the sonics of them. And I studied their stuff. And then I started counting. I started understanding a little bit more. And I think about like that winter, that like November 2018, I was going viral. Mm -hmm. Back to back. Do you... (laughs) Do you remember that poem? And if I asked you to recite any of it, can you? could you do it? <laughs> yeah, I definitely could. I definitely remember it. It's hard to forget, to be mm-hmm. honest. Um, prefer not to recite any yeah, of it. <laughs> but you but, remember. Of course. The, yeah. um, so then the next question I have is, 
you're on a poetry trajectory. Yeah. You start going viral and people are asking you, like, when did you start rapping? Yeah. It's not what you do. Yeah. What makes you decide, like, you know what? I actually am going to try this rapping thing as opposed to just sticking with the poetry. So I had dropped that in March. I graduated in May. I was applying for med school. It was so much going on. It's getting accepted, but I had so much to pay in tuition. Mm -hmm. Like when I thought about the whole thing, once I was done with school, I would have over four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in debt. Right. And as I'm rapping and I'm going viral, brands are reaching out, like I'm getting paid like at the time very little it was like I don't know, 2,500 to post or something like that. And then I grew it to 10,000 and 15,000 and 20,000. And I'm like, this is like for one post on Instagram. So I hate to say initially it was for the financial gain of things, like understanding that, um, you know, this was a long-term game that I wanted to play. And, um, but the one thing about me is I'm, I believe in being the master of everything I set out to do. So I'm not just going to do it because it gives financial gain. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it at the highest level. I'm going to do it the best. And so I focused in on it really, really hard. And I was complete things. So as far as I'm concerned, I completed my master's degree. I completed my bachelor's. And that was my case to my family. Like, I finished my stuff. I didn't drop out of school. Like, I finished my stuff. And now I'm on to my next leg of my career. My mom was like, you got six months to get this rapping thing that you're doing. Because I don't think she really understood it. Um, but now it's, uh, we got a lot of support in it. And I'm happy that I made the decision. It was God's plan for me all along. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a wonderful story about seizing that moment or seizing that opportunity. Yeah. Any words of advice for people who might be having similar moments? Maybe they just had their first viral hit. Um, whatever it is, something is starting to take off. Any advice for like when you have these moments, how do you like actually seize them and capitalize on them? I would say consistency is the key to anything that is amazing. Staying consistent at something and believing yourself even when no one is around to believe in you. Mm -hmm. It's so critical that even the people around you at the moment on your come up is important. Mm -hmm. Making sure that people are, that are aligned with you can encourage you and breathe life into you. And if they're not, please vacate their premises immediately. Because when you have a dream, you have to be laser focused because somebody less talented than you that believes in themselves just a little bit more is going to far surpass you and you're going to be miserable about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say fight that fight and believe in yourself more than anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and get to it. So I think... If I'm correct, uh, where we are, somewhere in here you decide to get baptized. Yeah. Did you always grow up in the church and just make a decision to get baptized? Or like what drove the decision to be baptized at 23? Yeah, no, I didn't grow up in the church at all. I wish I did. Maybe I know how to sing or something, <laughs> something useful, play an instrument. But no, I didn't grow up in the church. Um, my mom was very big on allowing us to create our own decisions and forge our own ways. Like she didn't want to force any specific denomination on us. And so she was like, you know, when you come to a time in life, whatever you feel inclined to lean towards, I think you should do it. And I want you to be expressive of it. So I explored a lot. I explored, I read every thing that you could think of from Judaism to Islam to Buddhism to Christianity. And I don't think you come to repentance without something escorting you there. I found my way with God, with my knees in the dirt and, you know, my head bowed. Very, very humbling moment when I was in undergrad. I was, I just felt lost with no direction about a lot. There's a lot of things that was going on in my personal and my family life. And I just felt like I was abandoned, like I didn't have anything or anyone, but I think it was because I didn't have a source. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not that I didn't believe in anything. It's just that I didn't feel like, I felt like I was just in this world by myself. And that couldn't have been the furthest thing from the truth. So my relationship with God was built from scratch and I wanted to honor it the right way. So before I got baptized, I read the entire Bible. I really wanted to have better understanding of everything and keep my faith um, strong before I decided to enter that vow and that covenant with him. And so, yeah, I got baptized here in L.A. Um, my second year here, right? I think it may be right before, right after I graduated from my grad school program. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love the journey. Like, I love that you decided to read the whole Bible before you decided to commit to Christianity. I also love just the journey that you explored. Yeah. Is there, in your current walk, 
do you still pull from any of those other things from Judaism, from Judaism, um, from Islam or any of those pieces also valuable pieces of your current walk? I think they're all the same. Mm -hmm. I know it'll probably be like controversial opinions about this, but I think, um, I think there's ultimately the same underlying message in every single uh, walk of life is that we have a source that, you know, is power based and that's just what it is. It's whoever you respond to. But I think there's so many commonalities in it that I draw from each one, of course, because I'm really drawing from one main hub, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I love the discipline that is Islam. Mm -hmm. um, I've always loved it. I think, you know, of course, I know. Um, I know Arabic, some Arabic, not fl fluent, of course, but I'm able to navigate, um, certain spaces in it. And I think it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful religion. A lot of, a lot of religions are though. I love the, the peace that comes with Buddhism as well. So, um, I think people should just express themselves however that looks. Mm -hmm. And just as long as you believe in something and understand this is not, just you here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. it. Okay, so back to the the rap journey. So you've yeah. gone viral. Yeah. You start studying your craft. You're studying the people who you love sonically. Yeah. The Jay Z's. Who else did you give me? The Jay Z's. Jada the, Kiss, the Fox, Jadas. Kim, Lauren, all the people. Okay. Yeah. And so from there, where do you go? Like now, are you dropping uh, videos every week, every month? Like, like what is your next step from there? Yes. So, um, I developed a thing called Lady Lundays where I dropped a freestyle every Monday for a while. It was months. I can't even quantify how many months it was. Maybe mm -hmm. six, maybe nine. Depends on what it was. The hottest beats out right now are some of my favorite classics that just went untouched for a while. So I was getting like 20,000 followers a month, like back to back. So I grew my fan base quite a few in just a few years. And mm -hmm. so. It's been a journey. As you're building that found fan base, yeah. is your the money you're getting as an influencer, is that also going up? No, okay. at first. And that's that's the part they won't tell you. It's like you can build this fan base and still not get paid for just having followers. Oh. Influence comes with a whole a whole lot of stuff. It's not just about you having followers, it's about you actually having like a brand. And I think me curating myself as a brand was able to help me get brand partnerships and get these like looks from, from major brands and stuff like that. But no, it wasn't always like that. I had a very stagnant journey for a very long time, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time where I wasn't making money or there was like living check to check or living like, you know, it was hard. It was mm -hmm. hard for a long period of time. But then you have those moments where you get one big whammy, like and you, if you know how to manage your money, and I would tell this to anybody. I hope to be in a space of mentorship on a higher level than I already am. But fiscal responsibility is not something that's taught enough in our black communities. And I think it could be, it could be extremely pivotal if we knew mm -hmm. how to keep our money mm -hmm. rather than how to just make money. Mm -hmm. So step one was tap into your craft and your art. Yeah. Step two, that allowed you to build an audience. Yeah. Step three, as you're perfecting your craft, you're also building your brand. Mm -hmm. How do you really get the monetization piece going? Did you hire people where people just come? Like, how do you get the monetization piece to start popping? Uh, no, I didn't hire people. Sometimes nobody got no money to hire nobody to do nothing. I think, again, staying consistent with stuff and also figuring out your target demographic, and all the brands that you would like to partner yourself with. Mm -hmm. I always thought to myself when I was first doing things, like, what are some brands that I naturally use? Like, this is not a force. This is not an ad. This is not a paid promotion. This is like, I wear this. I use this. I use these products. I have this. How can I reach out? And how can I, you know, get into that space? At one point, I had hired an agency. I had a sign with the agency. And they did nothing for me. I mean, nothing. I won't even tell you who they are. They did nothing. I didn't get one single deal through them. But then I was like, so what, like, I started YouTubing things. Like, how are people reaching out to brands and figuring out, like, who's their key point? Who who handles t uh, talent? Who handles, like, brand partnerships within this thing? Reaching out to them with emails, warming a deck. Get you yourself. were doing all this work on your own. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. But that's my college background is we learn to make business proposals. We learn to make decks. We learn to make whatever. So get your one sheet or your EPK or whatever you want to call it. List your followers. List your algorithm. Show how many females versus males are in your demographic. Show your target five areas. Show 
you know, all the things that make you a person on one thing and send it off to brands and say, listen, I think you partnering with me would be a great mutually beneficial situation. I already use your brand. It won't be inorganic. This is how I will market it like this. Maybe we can partner. And some things is not always monetary in the first, the first time. Sometimes you build relationships and you network for future bigger things, mm. you know? Yeah. My first campaign with a certain company, I think was like $1,500 back in 2019. I just recently did a brand partnership with them for over $60,000. Mm. So when we look at things like, you just have to play the long game. You don't know. Right. That's the lesson about not being short-sighted. Yeah. How do you turn 1500 into 60000 Right. That's the thing. <laughs> That's the thing. It, it takes steadfastness. It takes... Uh, the will to see it through. Mm-hmm. I think personally, a lot of people just, just give up or they, their eyes are on other people's paper. I never looked at anybody. I kept my head down in tunnel vision. I didn't care about, I have celebrity friends who are multi-million billionaires. Mm-hmm. That does, that has nothing to do with me. I have to stay focused on myself because the path of the narrow is the path of the successful. Comparison is the thief of joy, right? So if you continue to like look to your left, look to your right and see what they're making and what they got, you don't have enough time to focus on your own plate. So yeah. I'm going to ask you to double click into that gem you just dropped. The path of the narrow yeah. is the path to success. Yes. What is the path of the narrow? The path to success. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that just means keeping like a very tunnel vision approach to what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there's like this thing where everybody's like, if you get, if you got nine hustles, like it'll pay. Like it's like, okay, so this is the thing that they don't tell you is that until you get one hustle under wraps, I mean, fully already infrastructure and running and moving, those other nine are never going to be successful because you have to ground yourself in one. If you just do nine different things, it'll just, it's overworking you. Now you're overworked and underpaid. Yeah. A lot of what you're saying, you know, one of my favorite quotes that kind of ties into that is if you water all plants, like, all of them die, mm-hmm. right? Like you, you get one bucket. Yeah. And if you put that bucket on 10 different things, like there's no way that they all get to live and sprout, right? So you yeah. got to focus that attention. And then to your point, once you have that one thing rooted, yeah. it can give birth and branch so out. So much. So you got here and you found tremendous success, mm-hmm. um, by being narrow focused. Yeah. Um, by watering one plant. Yeah. Uh, so my question for you now is like, so what's next? Are you watering the same plant? Are you starting to water new plants? What's next for Lady London? Um, continuously watering more and more plants, expanding my garden though. You know, I, I think I started in this one small apartment of one plant and now I have a greenhouse and I hope to continue to have a field of plants if we're going to keep on the, mm-hmm. on that narrative. But, um, next, uh, short term wise, I'm working on my first album mm-hmm. right now. And I just, um, also, partner with Issa Rae in her mentorship program where I'm doing a documentary with Tubi, uh, new platform studios that is entirely focused on the makings of my new album and just kind of what goes into being an artist in the day-to-day life. So excited to bring you guys into my little introverted crabby worlds, you know? So one, I'm super excited about your album. I think that um, today, you know, hip hop has grown into so many genres and subgenres. And one of the ones, you know, in my day and age, it was all about lyricism. Mm. And I think you are a phenomenal, phenomenal lyricist. And so I can't wait to hear this next album when it comes out. Yeah. What I find interesting about as you're kind of watering multiple plants Mm -hmm. is that the documentary is still tied to the music, yeah. right? So they're synergistic in one sense, right? Was that done on purpose? Um, Yeah, I mean, that was the original approach is it's tied to obviously the makings of the music, but it's so much that goes into it as well. It's, mm-hmm. it's going to be about my family and about my life and about briefly touching on my upbringing, kind of like what brought me from here to here. And I think what's beautiful about it is called um, In Good Faith. Mm-hmm. And each episode is named after a Bible verse. And so, but each one will show, each verse will show it, uh, its face in, in the episode mm. and why it's so important. Mm. So yeah, it's a journey. It's a faith tied journey. It's a, it's a testimony, you know, to anyone who's ever had difficulty being understood. Mm. So 
Yeah. That faith walk is real, but that faith walk can also be a mass, a major blessing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So I'm also looking forward to this documentary. Yes. I think the approach about um, each chapter being tied to a different Bible verse is really interesting, feels yeah. fresh. Um, is there a verse, a mm -hmm. Bible verse in that documentary that is a favorite of yours that you can share with the audience? Yeah, I would say the finale, the final episode is James 5, 8. Mm -hmm. And it's a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And I love that verse because it touches on so much. <laughs> Obviously, somebody who's double-minded is like the, the fundamental of it. But more specifically, when I read it, it translates directly as you can't pray and worry at the same time. And I think we have in this generation, especially millennials, we are full of faith and full of fear at the same time. And it is mind-boggling. And too. I think... Agreed. I think, so it says in James 5, 8 and 9, it says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let him not believe he will receive anything from the Lord. And I think it's so pivotal to think about, like, if you're going to be scared and you're going to be faithful, you're not going to accomplish whatever it is that you're scared and faithful about. You pick a side. And, you know, you walk in it. Yeah. We walk by faith. I totally agree. I Like every day, every decision I make, yeah. I say to myself, it's either going to be driven out of fear or yeah. out of faith. Yeah. Right? Because you can't have faith. If you truly believe, yeah. if you truly believe that your God has your back, yeah. if you truly believe you have a God that won't let you fail, exactly. then where is the space in the room for fear? Exactly. Right? Then you must not truly believe. <laughs> All right? It's so it's got to be one or the other. Okay. Last question as we get out of here. Yeah. Any final words for the audience? Any? last things we didn't cover, any um, words of wisdom or advice that you would like to leave the audience with before we close out? I think I want to encourage anyone who just feels like they can't do it anymore. Like it's been so many days, especially early on in my career, where I was like, I don't really want to see tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people look at me and think that, but I'm saying this to anybody who has to be full of strength all the time to have to be the, the, the face of strength. You are necessary. Your purpose here is necessary. Your plan here is necessary. Your, your promise is bigger than your problems and fight the fight, fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's, that's all I would probably mm -hmm. say. Yeah. I, lied. I want to do one pickup. Um, you talked about, you mentioned this notion that you're an introvert. Yeah. What do you have to say to people who may be intro? Like, it could be mind boggling for people to see you doing what you're doing, right? Yeah. Making music, being out in the world, all of that stuff, but sure. classify yourself as an introvert. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? Like, do you think that those two things, clearly those two things can work together, sure. right? So what would you say to people who don't think or who think I'm an introvert, I could never do what Lady London is doing? Yeah. Never say never. I don't, I personally, I identify as an introvert, but I do know that I have, um, a lot of, socialness to me. I have allotted it because of the sake of my career. This is what needs to happen. Otherwise, you don't get to the next chapter where you're trying to go. I believe in evolution. I believe in um, adaptation and understanding like sometimes you have to... It's not about being the wave. It's more important to, to be the water. Like, it's not about going with the wave of things. Like, just be still and be the water sometimes. And sometimes the water has movement that is unfamiliar. So I would say anybody who thinks that they, like, can't be social or they can't have a public image, it's like, you know, you maintain whatever privacy you really want. To be honest, no one knows me. No one knows me. You know what I give you in my music, and you know if you meet me that. But no one knows the intricacies of my dating life, if I have anybody anywhere, because I keep things that I hold sacred, I keep sacred to me. Whatever you honor, you keep sacred. And you don't allow the internet or anyone else to have it. So I think you balance your life. Learn to balance and it'll be good. Yeah. Queen, thank you for taking the time thank to come you. here. Thank you for sharing whatever versions and pieces of your life you felt uh, relevant to share here today. Uh, just know that we at Revolt are cheering you on. Like I said, can't wait to see the, the documentary. Can't wait to hear the album. Yeah. And just honored that you would take the time to be here. Thank you for thank being you. on The Black Print. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be here. I appreciate you having me. Of course. What an incredible interview with Lady London. She is such an intellectual, brilliant mind. And I feel like she dropped so many gems. Um, one of my favorite 
kind of words of wisdom that she spoke to is this idea of mastering your craft. You know, it's not enough just to have a goal. It's not just enough to have a target. But she said, if I'm going to have a goal, if I'm going to have a target, then I have to master my craft. I have to aim to be the best. And I think that's something all of us can, can learn from. One of the other things that she spoke to that really spoke to me is this notion of you have to be able to see yourself beyond your own block. So many of us are limited to the three mile, five mile square radius that we live in. But she's saying that if you want to really become your best self, if you really want to reach your highest potential, then you have to start to imagine yourself beyond what you have seen. And then we spoke about this notion that one of the best ways to do that is to expose yourself to things beyond your block. Uh, I use the quote, exposure to the next level breeds an intolerance for your current situation. We've got to see ourselves beyond our block and then go get exposed to things that we wouldn't naturally see unless we were intentional and deliberate about seeking them out. And the last thing that she talked about that I think is important is she speaks to the power of education. You know, clearly from the way that she talks, she is well studied, she is well read, she is well researched. But the truth is for so many of us, education is not just a way up, it's a way out. All right.